Hi, I'm Mike Cohen of the Ingram in Phoenix, Arizona. Time to do another video showing you guys some of the stuff that I'm adding to my collection this week. I've been actually adding some stuff to the collection, but I feel like at this point, I'm really trying to slim down. I'm, I'm taking out about five to one the records I put in. Uh, I've kind of committed to the fact that I'm not going to expand my shelves anymore. I don't want to occupy any more rooms in my house with records. And, you know, I'm trying to go through at least every single week and pull stuff that I know that I'm probably not going to listen to in the future or that, you know, stuff that I haven't listened to in the past. I do have things in my collection that I have that I don't listen to because it's something I might find interest in in the future. I might like in the future and I don't want to have to hunt those things down. Prime example, and I've mentioned in the past, I'm not a huge Towns Van Zant fan, but I can see myself possibly getting into it a little bit in the future and I don't want to ever have to start from scratch 10 years from now trying to find those records because I got minty copies of everything now and that's happened in the past until but a couple of years ago I really wasn't much of a Cat Stevens fan but you know like a lot of music something caught my attention something grabbed me and I find myself listening to Cat Stevens quite frequently and it was kind of nice that I just had it on the shelf it was there I was in the library <laughs> I didn't have to hunt down anything I had Mofis and One Steps and UK pressings and English pressings, you know, I had it. Uh, but there is stuff on my shelf that I've done that for. And I think to you know, myself, like, there's no chance that I'm ever going to probably listen to this. And if I do, I probably can get something like this in the future somewhat easier. So I'm clearing a lot of stuff off. But another thing I'm doing is I'm actually, in the past, I've kept multiple copies because maybe I had a really nice cover of a record. Or maybe I had a really mint side one or a mint side two, but you know, so I would keep two, three, four copies of some records. A lot of times, it being the same pressing, I'm trying to get away from doing that. This next record was like a prime example. Uh, this is uh, Marilyn Manson's Antichrist Superstar. This is actually a first pressing. It was done by Simply Vinyl. Now I have a copy of this in my collection before this, but it was maybe a VG Plus record. It was a somewhat, you know, it was a, it was a played copy. And I found this one online sealed. So this was a was a sealed copy. Now this is actually the way I keep it on my shelf to show you how I do stuff like this to keep it intact. Just in case this type of cover off gas in the future, which it might, I'm always leery of this type of material. I actually open the record, I separate the discs. So I actually will store this next to it. So here I actually have the discs, right? I store it next to the jacket on my shelf to where I can just grab the discs, easily play them and not mess really around with the cover. But this was a, for me, something like this was a good purchase because I was able to pay a little bit more than I'm going to sell the other copy for. And I found this reasonable, but you know, it's an upgrade. Now in this case, I didn't have four copies, but there's been a lot of times recently to where I bought just the most cherry clean copy of a record and been able to profit because I'm selling four of a lesser copy and you know four of a VG plus record is going to sell for generally more than one near mint record but uh, there's a record that brings back a lot of childhood memories I had when I was really young I only had like an alarm clock you know obviously to get up to go to school and that was my sole like when I was really young that was my sole form of listening to music for a part of my life before that, actually, I had a record player after that. But at this period in my time, life, I only had that little clock radio. And I remember when this was new, I remember the beautiful people coming on the radio all the time and just thinking that was the coolest song. Lo loved, the, loved the record. And uh, yeah, I'm glad I got just a super cherry copy of it. So the next thing just kind of walked in the door. So check this out. This is a white label mono. Eagles Desperado. Uh, well past the era of mono records. What is this, right? So mono kind of fizzled in the United States for the most part in 1967. 1968 still had some mono records uh, that were being ma manufactured for retail sale. But for the most part, that was the end was 67. A couple things made it into 68. Those records are super rare and desirable. Some of the things like... Uh, the Doors Waiting for the Sun in Mono, big money, hard to find. The Birds, the Bees, and the Monkeys in Mono, very, I think that might be the most expensive of those mainstream Mono releases. 
But Mono continued after that in the form of DJ promo records. There's some Led Zeppelin stuff in Mono, and this particular record, which came out in 1973, is actually a Mono cut. Now this probably would have just been a fold down, right? But this is a Mono cut made for radio stations only. This guy walked in, uh, never seen it before. So I needed some cash, got a lot of great records, but this is the only one that I want to sell. I'm like, because my whole collection's like this. I'm like, oh boy. That's impressive. You know, call me in the future. But I was able to add that. I got, actually I might have the Eagle stuff. Look. I kind of generally sit in the Eagle section of my collection. I feel like that is a record that I might even have, just out of curiosity. A promo copy of, okay, so there, I do have a regular copy of it in shrink. And I actually have a mono, excuse me, a stereo promo. So that's kind of cool that I'm able to add. Yeah. Don't have to put it away later. It's kind of cool that I'm able to add the uh, mono. I don't know, that's the collector in me. One of my favorite series, and not even one of my favorite series, currently out of all the series that are coming out. Now I like the Atlantic uh, series, uh, uh, an Atlantic 75 series from Analog Productions. It would be the my favorite series right now if it was 33 or you know 33 versus 45. I like 45s, but for me 45s have to be like significantly better for me to want to play them frequently. Uh, I've mentioned it many times. The Doors, LA Woman, Analog Productions is done is so much better than everything else that I have that I really will not listen to that record anything but that Analog Productions 45s. But for the most part, if a record is not like that, significantly better, I really don't want to be listening to 45s too frequently, although there have been some fantastic records in that series, and I've actually included one of them in this video. But that being said, my current, that'd be my probably my second favorite series out right now. My current favorite series that is at market right now is actually the OJC by Concord. So where Blue Note titles have been done a bunch. We've had Music Matters, we've got Tone Post, we've got Blue Note Classics. A lot of great attention has been put to the Blue Note catalog, and some attention has been put to Concord's catalog, but not nearly, you know, Analog Productions did the Fantasy series. Maybe they did 100 titles from Fantasy, but again, they were all at 45. These are all at 33, but they're made kind of like a tone poet in the sense that it's a nice, thick tip-on jacket, right? And discs mostly cut by Kevin Gray which when I go back and listen to the Kevin Gray cut 33s that are done today versus those older analog productions titles from 20 years ago that have been done as well as part of this series, I prefer the 33s. This is a catalog that there's so much that they can mine from the, you know, from the, from the catalog. There's so many great titles that have not been done to death that really need to be redone. Some of the stuff has been done. The Prestige stuff that Analog Productions did is fantastic, but that was 50-ish titles, less than that. Some of those are blues titles, but this series is unbelievable. I absolutely love them. Uh, this is, I think I got both. I didn't pull both of them out, but Art Blakey, my favorite jazz musician of all time. Uh, maybe Art Blakey, Miles Davis, Art Blakey. I don't want to commit. <laughs> I, I do love Art Blakey. Art Blakey got me into jazz. But Caravan is such a great record. In OJC, I think this particular one is done by Kevin Gray. Although every single hype sticker shows that these are all cut by Kevin Gray from the original master tape. This is, yeah, this is a Kevin Gray cut. Matt Luthens, his apprentice, has been cutting some of the titles. They've been fantastic as well. They're cut at Coherent on Kevin's system. And... They sound fantastic, but keep in mind, although they all say cut by Kevin Gray from the original Analog Master Tapes and Preston RTI, some are cut by Matt Luthens. This one is not. This whole series, though, is absolutely fantastic. There's a lot of things I like about this series. A, they're at 33. B, they're titles that haven't been done to death. C, a lot of the titles that they're doing are titles that you cannot easily find clean copies of. You know, certain things like Riverside titles, I, I, I find cost more money, but I think it's easier to find clean Blue Note titles than it is to find clean Riverside titles. Uh, 
some of the stuff, the new, some of the squirrelier titles that they've done, man, you just never see them. They're so rare and they're so difficult to find clean. Like Tommy Flanagan's The Cats, the Coltrane Flanagan. Uh, but this is one of those records that, this is a more common record, but this whole series, you're getting things that are so difficult, like the Bill Evans stuff. You can find clean Bill Evans, Waltz for Debbie Live at the Village Vanguard. Live at the Village Vanguard, by the way, is on my top 100 imprint analog records you should own list from this series. But finding those records, originals, clean, like, good luck. I mean, even if you find copies that are near mint, you don't find copies that play near mint. So this series has been fantastic. Oh, and another thing, I actually am getting to the point, like I said at the beginning of the video, where I'm having space issues. I'm getting to the point where I kind of like the very, I like the non, you know, the non gatefold. This is, when you're in a situation like me where you have to, live with the space you have, you've decided you're not going to add any more space, you kind of get to the point where if you get too many thick gay folds or things that take up too much space, you got to sometimes take two, three records out to put one on the shelf. So this, right now, this is ticking all the boxes for me. Okay, this is kind of cool. I've had it in black vinyl, but I just recently got it in red vinyl. I'm going to, I sold my black copy already. But this is Meatloaf's Bad Out of Hell by Friday Music. Friday Music is a label that I've never really been totally nuts about. Uh, it's a goofy label because, okay, so picture this. I own a label, right? Okay, and the gentleman that owns Friday Music is Joe Raguso. Right, so you own, you own a label, and for some reason, Joe Raguso wants to do all the mastering himself and then have, I don't think Kevin does it anymore. I don't know. I haven't talked to him about it, but it was a really squirrely situation where Kevin cut all these records, but Joe like did the mastering on them. Like, what the hell was the reason for that? It, it must have been vanity. I don't know. Maybe I'm speaking out of turn here, but it seemed to me like maybe a vanity thing. You know, I'm not going to attempt to master any records in the future if I do releases. Uh, what I would do though is say, uh, here you go, Kevin. Uh, Good luck. Have at it. This is, you know, or Bernie or whoever I'm getting to do it. Like I would let these guys do it. But for the most part, I've not been nuts about the Friday music stuff. It's always been weird, especially considering Kevin Gray's name is attached to it. But on a side note, this is probably the best I've ever heard this record. This is the Kevin Gray cut, but, you know, what do they say on the back? Let's actually get ready to read it. Let's see. Mastered from the original international tapes by Joe Araguso and Kevin Gray at RTI. Who's in the dead wax? Kevin Gray at Acoustatech Mastering. Yeah, so Kevin's in there. But uh, this is a record that is a sonically flawed record to begin with. It's not one of those records that was recorded extremely well. I actually love Meatloaf. There's about 20 records that I'm very partial to because of my childhood. So again, I've told you guys in the past, I come from a very dirt poor family. My father had about 20 CDs, which were probably 20 more than anybody else we knew. But they were like, I think the BMG 13 for a penny. Well, I never remember any coming in the future. So I have a feeling Pops got his 13 CDs for a penny. <laughs> There was two of us in the house, so maybe he got one for me, got one for him, and uh, never seen another CD, but of those original CDs were Meatloaf's Bad Out of Hell and Back Into Hell. So they were played to death when I was young, and I really, truly love these two Meatloaf albums. All the other Meatloaf albums are pretty bad, uh, but I had a chance to see him. I was going to go. I had tickets to see him, I think, at a state fair maybe about 15 years ago. He canceled the show. Subsequently, afterwards, I found it. I found a DVD of kind of what he was touring at the time. And I remember putting the DVD on and thinking to myself, I didn't really miss much by not going to see that show. Poor Meatloaf was, yeah, he was pretty much done at that point. Uh but if you go watch like early Meatloaf videos when he was touring this album, some of those live performances are just, they're unbelievable. He was a hell of a performer. He truly was, you know, very, uh, you know, most of the stuff, the Jim Steinman produced, or the Jim Steinman wrote stuff was very operatic and just, 
he he not only sung those songs perfectly, but it fit. You know what I mean? He was the perfect guy for Jim's work. Okay, uh, I got a box of UK pressings in recently, and not a ton of them are great, but I did get the first Roxy Music. So I actually love Roxy Music, but oddly enough, my favorite Roxy Music is kind of the middle. I absolutely dislike Avalon. I don't think I've listened to Avalon in like 15 years. I don't like Avalon. Like that's my least favorite uh, Roxy Music record. Probably my second least favorite, but a record that I still listen to and somewhat frequently is actually their first record. Now everything in between, I don't think I've gone a week without putting a Roxy Music record on. I absolutely love Roxy Music. I love this as well. Avalon's really the only record I don't listen to. I want to say at this point I might have UK pressings now of all of them. I was missing this, but I found just a beautiful UK laminate cover in part of that collection. So I was able to add it. There was a few more UK pressings that were in that collection that I was able to add. This being, again, one of those records that I absolutely love. Uh, Faces. A Not As Good As A Wink. One of the all-time great, you know, Rod Stewart slash Ronnie Wood slash Jeff Beck. Some of those... The, the Rod Stewart slash guitar lick is unbelievable and so iconic. And this is one of them with Stay With Me. I'll never forget, I was in, I saw Rod Stewart a couple times. And it's really weird watching Rod Stewart now because he does these, uh, stand, which I like standards. I just don't like when Rod do, does them. He does these like uh, Frankie Sinatra type of, you know, tuxedo dress band straight 1950s Las Vegas set type pop routines in the middle of the concert. But what's weird is I feel like from memory, and I could have just hallucinated this, he he went from like doing Stay With Me, which is one of those great guitar tracks that I was telling you about, those great guitar licks. He went from like doing that to doing the crooner routine. And then it was like, then he comes back on and he's like, does, do you think I'm sexy? It was just such a surreal experience because it was like, what's going on here? Like musically, it was just all over the place. But actually, this is a record that I've not seen. I don't think I've ever even, I couldn't tell you if I've even seen a UK pressing of this in the United States. So that was cool to get. Okay. I absolutely do love the Tone Poets, don't get me wrong, it's hard to pick my favorite, but at this point in time, uh, again, I'm really digging the OJCs. Those are my favorite titles that have come out so far, but this was actually a favorite of mine recently, and that is uh, Booker Irvin's Textbook Tenor. This, this is technically a first pressing Blue Note. How exciting is that? This is this is a first pressing of a of a vintage Blue Note record. This originally came out as a twofer. You know, they used to do those bundled up twofers. Eh, back to the, what the hell? I, off the top of my head, I forgot what it was, but uh, it originally came out in the 70s as one of those two disc twofer sets. This is, excuse me, its first release. It's, it's also its first standalone release. It's its first standalone release as textbook tenor. So really, this is the first pressing of it. Very cool. But man, this is, God, I always wonder, like, what the hell are they thinking? Like, why, why did some of these titles get shelved? What an amazing record this is. Uh, so much fun to listen to. I really enjoyed this uh, quite a bit. Woody Shaw, Kenny Barron, Billy Higgins. What a great record. New-ish type blue notes in 2024. 20, uh, so I enjoyed that. This came out with... Jackie McLean's Action, Action, Action. But I've got that as, I want to say, the hell do I have that? I feel like I've got to have a couple of good copies of that as something original or, maybe that came out as a, I don't think it came out Music Matters. It came out as a, maybe classic records. I don't know. Don't hold me to any of that. But that was a great title as well. But this was one that took me by surprise. Okay. Craft Records One Step Series. This is essentially their take at a one step. 
So their latest is Isaac Hayes Hot Butter Soul. And this, out of all the one sets they've done so far, was the one that I was looking forward to the most. Because the first couple of titles, like for instance, the uh, John Coltrane Lush Life or the Eastern Sounds, Yosef Latif, there's, and the original OJCs of those records from the 80s are pretty damn good. The John Coltrane has been done. They, there's great copies of that out there. The thing is with 1970s Soul is... I've heard what audiophile masterings can do to those records where they just kind of leave more of what's on the tape in the mu you know, on the record. They don't cut the bass. They put it on higher quality vi vinyl. And the results have just been mind boggling. So when I saw this get announced, I thought to myself, oh man, this has the potential of being absolutely a banger. And uh, yeah, I think they did... I don't know, is this a bad sign? I got mine. It's, uh, I don't know if you can see that on the camera. I got number 666. But uh, maybe I just have uh, a satanic, demonic version of this record, but it is, it's on fire. It's absolutely unbelievable. This record, I, I cannot recommend this more highly you want to own this record. This Isaac Hayes Hot Butter Souls Hot Butter Soul is unbelievable. Blue Note, or excuse me, uh, Mobile Fidelity's done it. The original. I've got many copies of this record. They don't even hold a candle to this. This has been the first. This is like where they should have started off with the label, you know, with this series. But I feel because of the way the market is now, I don't know how many more of these we're going to get. But this particular title. It's just an absolute home run. Uh, you know, and they're reasonable-ish. It's $110. They're done on, I'll show you, they're actually done on VR900 Compound, which is the absolute best vinyl formulation. You know, you can see it. It's see-through. It's the absolute best vinyl formulation you, you can get. The best. Uh, I kind of like this configuration. Unfortunately, this is direct to consumer only. So you got to get this directly from Kraft. But holy cow, I had to get it from Kraft. It's fantastic. They really just knocked it out of the park with this. You know, it's 110 bucks. It's a little on the high side, especially from a direct to consumer product. Uh, the box is mediocre-ish, but they do this like, like plastic cube inlay, which can't be super cheap. But the boxes of all the one steps, I don't know. The box is kind of on the uh, lower end side of everything, if not the lowest of the of what is available. But they do a good, the covers are really nice. They're not glossy, but they're those thick tip-on type jackets. But uh, anyways, uh, they're also the cheapest. So given that, uh, you know, uh, who cares? But the, the Sonics of this record are absolutely unbelievable. Highly recommend this. What a great record too. It really bumps. All right, from the Analog Productions series, this particular record, the Crosby, Stills, Nash Couch album has been fantastic. I, I've loved this. It, it's not only sonically probably superior to anything I've ever heard. I'm pretty sure at this point it is so far. I haven't done a really like super deep comparison to where I've listened to every single record, but I've listened, I went back and listened to the MoFi, I went back and listened to the original. And I put a few others on, and so far I was like, this is on top. Uh, unfortunately, they raised the price of these, $5, of all the Crosby, of all the CSNY-related stuff. And I think that's probably because of the cover. Although, Chad, I didn't ask him. I probably will at some point, but I'm going to assume it's because of the cover. It's this beautiful linen cover. They really just knocked it out of the park with these sonically... This record is unbelievable. 100% all analog mastered and cut to lacquer from the original master tapes. I love the sparse code. Uh, not that anybody will admit it, but I really take pride that I'm, I really truly believe that I'm the guy that got these on these back at these records. Seeing it, you know, uh, is super cool. It's so awesome. It's there forever. Nobody ever in the future, and the reason I call for it during the whole Mobile Fidelity debacle a couple years back was 
you know, and I remember talking to Chad at the time and he's like, you know, well, it's on our website. And he, he you know, he was being very forthcoming. Like we're, we're honest. We're on, we'll tell you what we're putting out. And I remember saying to him like, yeah, I know it's on your website, but I bought records from your website 20 years ago and they're not on your website no more. And people that are getting into vinyl don't know to check the website or they're not on the website anymore because it's a discontinued record. You know what will never go off of your website? This on the back of the record. Like, this is what we need. 50, 100 years from now, somebody will be able to look at that now assuming the information is accurate, which obviously we know from past, uh, sometimes it's not as cut and dry as that, but for the most part, what it tells you here is anything anybody will ever need to know by looking at the record and never having to go out and seek information elsewhere. And it's so cool to have that. But getting back to this record, it's so far, God, the best I've ever heard. It's unbelievable. What a, what a killer record. It's one of those records that's not necessarily the highest fidelity record ever. And the MoFi had its moments, but I felt the MoFi was kind of a little bit it had highs and lows. Like, I, I didn't feel like a lot of that record. I didn't think the mastering, like, I kind of felt like you were, it was a little bit choppy to me to where the record didn't go uh, together, to where, you know, a song, mastering is not only to, imp to get the overall sound of the record you want, but sometimes when you master a record, it is to uh, get songs that, were recorded maybe separately to gel with each other. And I kind of got the feeling listening to that, that some of those came off as really good, really fantastic on the MoFi, but some of them just didn't seem to fit with the others. And that's, again, that was like my initial thoughts on it. But Bernie Grumman cut this. I think this uses the old classic records parts. Unbelievable. Killer version. Highly recommend it. Uh, the series has been fantastic so far. There's been a couple titles that I'm like, eh, you know, okay. But there's been nothing that I've gotten from this series that's been like a disappointment. Uh, some of the titles are like, holy cow, this is so great. And then some of the titles are like marginal improvements. But this is one of those that's uh, on the upper end of holy shit. Uh huge Rolling Stones fan, seen the Rolling Stones 17 times, going to see them in May. I'm pretty sure that'll be the last time I see them, right? I mean, they do a tour, whatever, eight, four, four, five years, three, four, five years. Uh, this will be my 18th, 18th time seeing them, I think. Uh, are they going to tour when they're in like their mid 80s, 85, 86? Probably not. I feel like this is the last time I'm going to see them. Fingers crossed. I'm going to take my son to it as well. I kind of hope that's going to ignite him to Stop listening and playing only Metallica. Fingers crossed. But love live Rolling Stones. This is a killer concert live at the Will Turn, right around the turn of the 2000s. Solomon Burke comes out, does a couple numbers with them. They cover an Otis Redding song on this. Great live show from kind of the era when I started getting to see the Rolling Stones a lot. I saw them first on their No Security Tour in the late 1990s. But when I was the most active in seeing them, kind of because I was willing to travel a little bit for them, and also I got lucky because I saw them in Florida and then they moved to, you know, I got to see them on a tour and then, uh, then I moved States and got to see them again. And then when I was out West, I kind of had access to see them in other places that were close. Whereas in Florida, that's a little bit more difficult because the next closest city might be 20 hours away. Okay. Back in the day, Rhino used to do amazing all analog cuts from the original master tapes. And I think this is probably one of them. I don't know, but I, 33 version of John Coltrane's Giant Steps. Now I don't have the Analog Productions version of this at the house yet. It just came in here recently. I cleaned my copy. I haven't brought it home. I haven't had a chance to listen to it yet, but I wanted to have this. Uh, these are notoriously like all over the map as far as pressing quality. I've had a lot of these have no fill in the past. So be careful with this one if you're seeking it out. I'm pretty sure this was done from the master tape, but I could be wrong. But it says mastered from Kevin, mastered by Kevin Gray at Acoustatech Mastering. But I wanted to have the Kevin Gray cut of this, but this is maybe the third copy of this thing that I've had. Uh, and it does not have no fill. Now, now you can't get it anymore. It's not in print. Uh, 
whatever stamper they were using probably wore out because I think it might have the same barcode on it, but they've taken off the Kevin Gray information on the hype sticker and it's cut by just somebody else. But uh, yeah, it's recently this was in my store. That's a price tag of mine that's about four years old. So, okay. Last, I'm going to show you a record that is up there with the top three, four, five. I'll put it in the top five and maybe closer to the top greatest live albums of all time. And that is James Brown, Live at the Apollo. This is kind of the record that made live records a thing. Before this, live releases of records really weren't a thing. They didn't exist. This changed all that. This was such a huge success. It changed the way live performances were done on vinyl, you know, from that point on. Uh, King didn't believe in this from story, you know, the stories I read. He had a, James Brown had to finance this himself, but it was such a huge success for them and for James. I mean, it changed his career, but also other acts started following suit by actually recording stuff live. And who knows, not been for this record, maybe uh, we wouldn't have a lot of the live stuff that we have now from the latter part of the 60s. Absolutely fantastic. Killer record. I have multiple copies of this. This is like a mid-60s pressing. I don't keep a lot of sealed records in my collection. I might actually open this, <coughs> excuse me, on a video in the future. I've often talked about how King records were notoriously crappy right out of the package. Uh, this is a sealed copy from the mid-60s. More than likely, this is going to come out of the packaging VG to VG+, Plus, which is how King records were back in the day. I've opened some in the past. They were notoriously crummy quality-wise, and this is probably no exception. But uh, as of now, it's just going to sit on my shelf. Not a first pressing or anything, but again, the first pressing wouldn't have even been sealed. They weren't really sealing records in the you know, late 50s, early 60s. 1960, I think this came out originally. But uh, mid-60s, that's when it kind of took hold. But yeah, kind of cool. I think I might open this in the future and check it out. <laughs> but what, what an iconic record. Definitely up there with the greatest live records of all time. All right, guys, check us out on the website at theingroove.com. Until next time.